This is the Unlovable Vultures. It is part of the Unlovable series, which has proven to be extremely popular. I'm quite pleased as how popular this idea of these unlovables has been. This one is going to, we're going to focus on vultures. I'm going to give you some cool information about vultures and why maybe they shouldn't be considered unlovables, as well as some activities that I hope that you can bring back into whatever your classroom situation is or your teaching situation is, whether it's formal educator, whether it is a parks or a museum educator, whether it's homeschool, or maybe it's just you want, you're educating your children or your grandchildren. So before talking about the vultures, let's do a little bit of an introduction. I work for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. If you're not familiar with what the Arizona Game and Fish Department does, we are the state government agency that is responsible for managing all of Arizona's native wildlife. That is over 800 species of animals that we are responsible for making sure that the populations are doing okay. We don't want too many of them because if you have too many of them, they overuse the resource and then they can, could, they can cause a population collapse, an ecosystem collapse. We also don't want too few of them because then they risk not having the numbers to be able to reproduce and survive and eventually lead to extinction. So we implement policies to keep that kind of at that golden number of, of whatever that population needs to in order to survive. We do our best to, to do that. Most people interact with us through hunting and fishing. You buy a hunting license, a fishing license. We are the law enforcement agency that comes to make sure that you're following your bag limits or you're hunting in season or whatever that happens to be. But we are more than just the hunting and fishing. We are all the wildlife in Arizona. We are a public agency, we're a government agency, but we don't operate like your traditional government agency. We don't take taxpayer dollars, general taxpayer dollars. So there's nothing from our income tax, nothing from your sales tax that comes to us. We operate much more like a business on what we call a user pay model. So it's the users of the resource that are the ones that are paying for it. So that's where the hunting and fishing license is coming. You buy a hunting license, you buy a fishing license, that money comes directly back to the department for the management of those species. We do have a few other funding sources. This program, Focus Wild Arizona, which I'll talk about in just a minute, including my salary, comes from the state lottery. So when you buy a lottery ticket, a portion of that money goes towards the winnings that people can win, as well as to various state programs. One of those programs is the Heritage Fund, which was passed by the voters in the 90s with the ultimate goal of protecting Arizona's heritage. So a certain chunk of money went to state parks to protect sort of our cultural heritage, and a certain chunk of money went to Arizona Game and Fish to protect our wildlife heritage. What's cool about those funding sources is that those are what we often use to protect some of our non-hunted species. So a lot of our bald eagle work, a lot of our black-footed ferret work, and some of the, that those types of species use heritage funds for to, to help us manage that's also where our many some of our education programs come from which is what focus wild arizona is focus wild arizona is our k-12 education program just a general wildlife education program so our goal is to help you as educators bring wildlife concepts and wildlife issues into the classroom so we provide you resources and support to do that now we are a small group within Focus Wild Arizona. It's pretty much me, and then I have a supervisor, and then there's some people that work at our wildlife center, and that's it. So we don't do a lot of in-class stuff. On occasion, I will go into a classroom, but if I did that, that's all I would be doing. We have found that a, a tremendous amount of our, our value is in providing you guys as the educators the support and the resources you need. So I work behind the scenes. I do professional development like this. I do resource development. I do curriculum development, all to help you and provide you that support so that you can share a passion for wildlife for, with your students, whatever those students might be. And so my name is Eric, and I'm the Wildlife Education Coordinator for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I've been in that role for almost 15 years now. Prior to that, I was a middle school science teacher, so I taught seventh grade science primarily. I also did some social studies. I also picked up eighth grade occasionally. I did a little bit of language arts. I did a little bit of math. I was, I was a teacher in the Littleton School District over in Avondale, and then I was a teacher in the Kyrene District over in Chandler prior to taking this position. I've also have a lot of other background in science education. Uh, I have worked at the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum as a, as a volunteer docent. I've worked at the Phoenix Zoo as an outreach coordinator. I have worked at the Challenger Space Center. I've designed curriculum for various organizations, including some of the Mars rovers and the Mars orbiters, um, as well as a number of other things. So I've been involved in science education for, for more than 20 years. So that's me, that's, that's the department, but now let's talk about vultures a little bit. What I want to do is kind of start with 
what was the inspiration for the series, this Unlovables series that that we did? Um, the inspiration came from a book. It's out of print now. You, you might be able to find it at a library. You might be able to find. I don't think you can find it on Amazon. You'd have to go to one of these specialty bookstores to find it. It was a book that I read years ago, and it always stuck with me. We talk about the power of some of these resources sometimes as, as educators, and what what, what we never know what's going to cl click with a with a child. This is one of those books that I read a long time ago, and I always was was drawn to the concept, and I wanted to find a way to integrate it in. It's a book called Animals Nobody Loves by Ronald Rude. Each chapter is devoted to a different animal. So there's 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 a chapter on bats, there's a chapter on vultures, there's a chapter on coyotes, there's a chapter on octopi, there's a chapter on rats. So the different things, and, and he just presents it in, a, in an interesting way of, of why, you know, why people might not like these creatures, but why you should like them. And so that was the inspiration. I'm not pulling a lot of information from that book because it is somewhat dated, but that's kind of where the idea for this came from. But this is a quote that came from the Cyclopedia of Wonders and Curiosities specific to vultures. And you can read it there. I'm going to go ahead and read it as well, because otherwise it's just a bunch of silence here. Vultures are very indolent and may be seen loitering for hours together in one place. It is said that they sometimes attack young pigs and eat off their ears and tails, but those instances are rare. It sometimes happens that after having gorged themselves, these birds vomit down the chimneys, which must be intolerably disgusting. So at the end of the night, century, this was essentially the viewpoint that people had of vultures. What we're hoping to do after today is to dispel some of that negativity about vultures. And I'm sure that most of you don't have those feelings, but I'm sure that there are some of your students, whether it be for cultural reasons or for past experiences, that they might have a fear of vultures. So we're going to hopefully deal with that a little bit. What I want to do now is look at pop culture portrayals of vultures and how these how vultures have been portrayed specifically in cartoons, some of the some of which your kids may be watching, some of these may be a little bit older and your students might not be familiar with them, but you might be familiar with them. Does anybody know who that guy is? Does anybody remember him? What was his name or what cartoon show was he on? Guess on Looney Tunes. Good guess not correct looney tunes will appear here in just a minute here this guy is called buzz buzzard and he's actually from woody woodpecker so the cartoon with woody woodpecker and he was a vulture he was a buzzard we're going to use the term buzzard and vulture interchangeably in the u.s that's pretty much what it is what i have found this isn't always the case but typically people from the east coast it seems call them buzzards and people from the western part of the country call them vultures for the most part, it's the same animal when we're talking about them in the United States. So this was Buzz Buzzard. He's Woody Woodpecker, and he was actually portrayed as a con artist. So we had a very negative image of vultures in this particular cartoon. What about this guy? You want to take a stab at that one? This guy from Looney Tunes. This is where our Looney Tunes one comes from. He, known as Beaky Buzzard. And I already mentioned he was from Looney Tunes, and he was kind of portrayed as simple-minded. Again, not a positive representation of buzzards or vultures. What about these guys? Does anybody know what movie those guys were from? They didn't really have a name. They were from a movie. It's for Jungle Book and a guess for Snow White. And somebody just went generic and said, just a Disney movie. You are correct. It is a Disney movie. It actually happens to be vultures from Snow White. And whenever they were on screen, they sort of portended for danger. Again, three negative connotations for vultures in cartoons. We'll do one final one here. And if you remember where these guys are from, these guys might be my favorite ones. Robin Hood, that is correct. These are from Disney's Robin Hood. Their names were Trigger and Nutsy. And they were often kind of portrayed as being incompetent, that they couldn't do their job really well. Um, and that they kind of became the comedic relief in that movie to some extent. Again, four portrayals, four cartoons, all of them negative. This is what our kids are viewing. Quote by Bertrand Russell, the main source of superstition and one of the main sources of cruelty to conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. Over the next hour or so, is to work on conquering that fear. Educate and provide cool information about vultures and why we want vultures around, to some extent, why they're actually helpful to us as humans, um, so that we can overcome this fear or this idea that vultures are bad, that they are truly unloved. So let's start a little bit here with 
a map here. What I want to talk about here to start with are the vultures. The vultures are kind of divided up into the New World vultures and the Old World vultures. Let's start with the New World ones, the ones that are found in North America and South America. Those are the ones we're going to be focusing on for the most part through this this talk, although we, we'll, we'll address some of the other issues, some of the other ones as the workshop proceeds and, and in general terms vultures. But I want to make sure that we're all clear on those that are found um, sort of locally. The king vulture is one of our new world vultures, and he is found down in South America. And then we have the yellow-headed vultures. There's actually two species of yellow-headed vultures, um, but both of them are also found down in South America. And then we have the Andean condor. Andean condor, Andes Mountains, probably can indicate that that one is also found in South America. Start getting to the friends that we're a little bit more familiar with. This is the black vulture. These guys are actually found in North and South America. We have them here in Arizona. Just like our friends, the turkey vulture, which is also found in North and South America and found quite commonly across North and South America. And the final vulture, the six species or seven species, if you break out the yellow-headed of vultures, is the California condor. California condor is found in North America, primarily in the Southwest, California, Arizona, New Mexico is where they're found right now. They're an endangered species that we are working on recovering back to population that can sustain itself. If you go up to the Grand Canyon, it's, it's not uncommon for you to be able to see them. If you go up to the Navajo Bridge on the way to Lee's Ferry, you can sometimes see them around the bridge. You can see them on the North Rim. You can see them in Zion National Park. So there are these places that you can see these California condors, but they are pretty rare still today. And we're going to talk a little bit about them later. But these are the six species found in North America. Overall, though, there are 23 vultures species, and it's difficult to classify vultures. They share some characteristics with hawks and eagles. That includes a hooked beak, a diet of meat, and excellent eyesight. As such, they are often grouped with birds of prey. However, they lack the true talons of other raptors. Genetic studies suggested that New World vultures, those six that we've already shared with you, shared a common ancestor with storks. So in 1998, the American Ornitholo Ornithologist Union moved them from falconiforms order to an entirely different order, siconiforms. This was challenged, and in 2007, about nine years later, they moved them back to falconiforms. And three years after that, in 2010, he just decided to create a whole new order of birds called occipiters, basically, with hawks, eagles, and vultures together and then leaving falcons and caracaras into a separate order, the falconiforms. So this has been going on where we don't quite know where these birds get placed. Right? There is no debate about old world vultures, however. They do share a common ancestor with hawks and eagles. We think the ones in the Americas share a common ancestor with storks, but we know that the old world ones share one with hawks and eagles. So now many people just lump all vultures whether they are new or old, in with raptors, but then they make the distinction of predatory raptors and scavenging raptors. So that's how we've kind of solved this right now, is to say, okay, they're raptors, but you have the ones that hunt, which are the eagles and the hawks and the falcons, and then you have the ones that scavenge, which are going to be the vultures. So between the old and the new world vultures is an example of convergent evolution. Organisms who are not closely related independently evolve similar traits to adapt to similar environments or niches. All vultures have featherless heads and long necks to stick their heads into carcasses without getting material stuck to their feathers. It's how they keep clean. You're sticking your head into a disease-ridden, decomposing body, and if you had a bunch of feathers on your head, all the bacteria and all those little parts can get stuck in those feathers. So they have a bald head, which makes it easier to clean. They all have flat feet, which are better for walking rather than grasping. And all vultures have excellent eyesight to find food while soaring high over the earth. But there are some big differences between vulture species. Many old world vultures have developed very specialized diets that we don't see in the Americas. This includes species that eat palm fruits and eggs. The bearded vulture eats almost entirely bones. 
They will fly high into the sky with the bones and then drop them onto rocks below them to expose the nutrient-rich marrow that's inside. Bearded vulture may very likely be the one responsible for the idea vultures kill livestock, as indicated by our earlier quote about the pigs. However, we a myth. It hasn't been observed. As mentioned, vultures rely heavily on their eyesight. In the New World, there are only two vultures that actually have a sense of smell, the turkey vulture and the yellow-headed vulture. All the other vultures, all the other four species of vultures, don't have a sense of smell, which is common in birds. Many birds don't have a very good sense of smell. They rely on their eyesight. Two vultures, the turkey vulture and the yellow-headed vulture, do use a sense of smell to find their food, which is beneficial if you're talking about an, you're eating food that's decomposing and tends to smell a lot. But again, it's not common in the vulture king, in the vulture family. Now, turkey vultures and black vultures here in the Americas, their populations are actually doing pretty good. But that is more the exception than the rule. On a global scale, vultures are more likely to be threatened than any other type of raptor. We talk about the challenges that bald eagles have or the challenges that golden eagles have. And that there are significant challenges, but vultures as an entire family have more species that are actually threatened than other raptors. Life International lists 15 of the 23 vulture species as species of conservation concern. You can see on this graphic here, we're talking about the ones that are in Africa and Eurasia, 11 of the 16 are at risk of extinction in our lifetimes. And you can see a little graphic here. What is the cause for these issues with vultures and, and these near extinction for species. Let's take a look at Africa and then we're going to bring it back to the United States. This is a graph that shows the collapse of Africa's vultures. The yellow line that's running along the top that's almost flat with maybe a slight reduction is all birds. This is their population overall, the chance of going extinct, all birds overall. And the red line that sort of plummets there on the right hand side is showing the 11 species of African vultures. Seven of the 11 African vulture species are at risk of extinction in our lifetime. That's, that's a higher percentage than birds in general. Okay. So what is happening? Why are we seeing these extinct, this, this extinction crisis, this plummeting populations in Africa? There are four main causes that we've been able to pinpoint. The main one being poisoning. 61% of vultures are dying as a result of poisoning. Oftentimes it's by poachers who are poisoning elephants and rhinos to get access to the ivory. And then when the when they leave when they get the ivory and they leave the the carcass of the elephant there, the vultures will come in and they will get poisoned inadvertently as well. There's a number of them that are belief-based use, so beliefs in traditional medicines that various body parts of the vultures may serve um, specific purposes or may help with healing or various disorders is playing a role. Nine percent is electrocution and collision. Remember, this is Africa, so this is birds being electrocuted, being hit by cars, whatever it might be. And then there's a final one percent that's just sort of other other ways that they're they're killed. But the 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 one we're going to focus on a little bit here, because this applies in the U.S. as well, is poisoning. And I and I kind of found this the stat to be to, to be somewhat startling. Is one poisoned elephant carcass can be responsible for 500 dead vultures. So that that's a lot. So one poacher takes out of an, an elephant, poisons it, leaves the body. We could see 500 dead vultures as a direct result of that. Pretty startling. Pretty stunning. But. There is some some good news. Turkey vulture populations seem, and black vultures actually, seem to be bucking this trend that we see worldwide. Turkey vulture populations are increasing, at least what we see. And both turkey and black vultures appear to be increasing their range north. So they're expanding their range and increasing their numbers. So what I want to ask you is why? Come up with some reasons why we think that turkey vultures and black vultures seem to be do, seem to be doing well in the United States and in the Americas in general, while so many of these other species are having problems. Just throw down some ideas in the chat or in the Q and A, and we will see how you guys do. So we have one guess that it might be getting warmer, so climate change may be an impact, which could possibly explain the expansion of their range. Any other ideas? Less poaching in the use of lead bullets in hunting, which 
could address the, the poisoning issue. Cattle ranching and farms, factory farms. All right, so there are a lot of good reasons. I'm going to go ahead and talk about what, what we think are based on some of the research that's been out there. Um, one of them, we, somebody mentioned highways. I saw highways on there. Increase in density of roadways. We actually think maybe making an impact because we have so many roads in the U.S. It may actually be helping these vultures. And the reason for that is there's going to be more roadkill. More animals are killed on the wild on, on the roads, which provides a constant food source for these vultures. Another one is increasing deer population. We were actually doing quite well in the United States and in North America in general in our species. There was a time when we were not. In the early 1900s, we were on a very negative trend to lose much of our wildlife. And we implemented some policies, including hunting licenses and bag limits and, and, and all these different things that we implemented to make sure that we could bring animals back. And so we took animals like deer, elk, pronghorn, turkey, that were near extinction at the beginning of the of the 20th century and we brought them back and now we have over a million or more of those animals so increasing deer populations is helping climate change is, is certainly going to make a difference that's going to count we see that with any species out there right now is we see this upward movement in the, in the northern hemisphere of species ranges they seem to be moving north because as, as the climate warms it makes those habitats that used to be too cold for them to survive in now a little bit more accessible also an increase in large cities this might seem somewhat counterintuitive but actually as the increase as the urban heat island idea that that cities end up being warmer because of all the pavement and all the concrete is allowing vultures to stay warm in cooler temperatures so they they might have to migrate less and 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 if you know anything about migration it is probably the most dangerous time in any bird or any animal that migrates it's that most dangerous time in their life cycle so if you can remove that and you can keep a bird in an area because it's warm and they can still find the food that they need then they they you could take that piece out of their life cycle and they might have an increase in chance. So the urban heat island may be, may be in growing this. And then, of course, just better knowledge and protections. Someone mentioned cattles, cattle ranching. Um, ranchers used to kill vultures by the tens of thousands. Uh, they believe that they spread disease and they killed livestock. You saw that quote at the beginning where they would eat the pig's ears, things like that. There's actually very few documented cases of vultures taking live prey. And it's usually in an unusual circumstance. We do have evidence that vultures sometimes eat the placenta of different animals so if there was a newborn calf for example and then the placenta comes out vultures may actually be drawn to that so sometimes that gets this idea that they're eating these live animals when they're just eating the placenta also if the bird is caught in a trap or in, the, in captivity they sometimes exhibit different behaviors which may mean that they might try to e eat live animals but in the wild typically it's very unusual to see a, a, a vulture try to take a live animal so as ranchers get more informed about that they have chosen they don't really kill the vultures to the levels they did also we in the united states we implement of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in the early 1900s, which, which put protections on all migratory birds, migratory and songbirds, that included the vultures. Um, so that stopped the killing of so many vultures. And as a result, if we just took that single stress out of the vultures' lives, that they could expand their population. So we are seeing some tremendous successes with turkey vultures and black vultures here in the United States entirely out of the woods the reality is there's really limited research on vultures there's just not a lot of people that like to study them so the the, the literature is somewhat sparse so how much do we can we really say that we know about their populations it was mentioned earlier um i believe sarah mentioned the decline based on lead lead-based bullets and hunting lead poisoning is the leading cause of death in condors the endangered species that we're trying to bring back and it's the main obstacle to condor recovery in arizona and utah and lead poisoning has been found to impact other vulture species and other raptor species. Um, studies have identified lead ammunition as the main source of lead exposure in condors. And basically give you an idea here of how that works. A hunter uses lead ammunition, the lead shot, and the bullet fragments remain in the game carcass. When the hunters field dress it and they remove the gut piles, sometimes they just leave the gut piles, which typically historically wasn't a bad thing because the vultures could come down and eat the gut piles while the hunter takes the, 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 the rest of the animal for food. But in that gut pile then are these fragments of these lead bullets that are that have been torn apart and are in those gut piles and so when the when the condors come down and feed on those gut piles they are ingesting that lead we have found lead fragments in the condor digestive tracts and so we know that that is a, a primary the primary reason for their death now in the u.s that's the biggest issue doesn't mean that that you know our management efforts aren't working it's just that that's the leading cause of death right now 
unfortunately or fortunately, depending, I mean, for their natural history, condors do concentrate in heavily hunted areas because that's where the food source is. And so as we're using these lead bullets and lead ammunition in these areas, it is potentially adding this stress to condors and eagles and some other vultures as well. This picture down below on the bottom of the screen, you can see that's actually a coyote that was shot with a lead varmint bullet. And all those little silver dots that you see throughout are the toxic lead fragments that are scattered throughout the carcass. So what is the solution to all of this? I'm going to show you two movies. There's a little bit of a duplication between these two these two clips. They're just about a minute and a half each, so I apologize for that. But I felt the good one explained some things a little bit better than the than the non lead ammunition one does. But they both work in concert with each other. So I'm going to show you this first one, which talks about lead ammunition ballistics and how they work, and so you can see what's happening inside an animal's body once it's shot with lead ammunition. We use ballistics gel to demonstrate some of the differences between lead and non-lead ammunitions. When a lead bullet hits an animal, it breaks apart, leaving sometimes hundreds of pieces in remains that are left in the field. The ballistic gel freezes the moment of impact. It allows us to look at how a bullet reacts when it hits an animal, and we're able to capture and see the impact of the bullet. After we've captured the bullet in the gel, we can radiograph those gels, and that gives us the true picture of the extent of the fragmentation. When looking at the x-ray of the path of the lead bullet, we can see how much the lead bullet fragments. All the white spots in this radiograph are lead fragments. When we weigh lead ammunition, we find that it can lose up to 40% of its original weight. Wildlife species such as bald eagles, golden eagles, and California condors inadvertently ingest lead fragments as they're feeding on remains left in the field. Repeated exposures over time lead to detrimental health effects and even to death. The number one factor limiting the recovery of the critically endangered California condor is the inadvertent ingestion of lead fragments on the landscape. You know, one of the things that hunters can definitely do is, is by simply using a different tool they can eliminate an entire source of lead that will then uh, dramatically reduce exposures in, in, in wildlife and in, especially in the California condor. I'm going to show the second one because I think there's a really good graphic in here. What they do is they compare the lead ballistics with the non-lead ballistics. We shoot a non-lead and a lead bullet into the ballistics gel to demonstrate some of the differences between lead and non-lead ammunitions. As we look at the gel that was shot with non-lead ammunition, we can see a rapid rate of expansion, a great initial wound channel, deep penetration, and no fragmentation in the gel. After we've captured the bullet in the gel, we can radiograph those gels, and that gives us the true picture of the extent of fragmentation. In the radiograph of the non-lead gel, we don't see any white spots that would indicate fragmentation. But by comparison, if looking at the x-ray of the path of the lead bullet, you can see how much fragmentation there is. We can weigh the spent bullet, and in comparison to its original weight, we can determine how much has been lost due to fragmentation. When we weigh lead ammunition, we find that it can lose up to 40% of its original weight. But when we weigh the non-lead ammunition, it typically retains about 98% of its original weight. There's a lot of benefits to using non-lead ammunition. This rapid rate of expansion, deep penetration, and the main difference is you don't have the extent of fragmentation with the non-lead as you do with the lead. And because of the high weight retention, you're not leaving fragments on the landscape. Um, the North American Non-Lead Partnership was formed in 2018 by the Oregon Zoo, the Peregrine Fund, and the Institute for Wildlife Studies. And it seeks to expand the coalition of hunters, anglers, and other conservationists dedicated to improving ecosystem and wildlife health by choosing non-lead options. Three state wildlife agencies, the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife have recently joined the partnership, and at least five sports groups have pledged their support. One, the Arizona chapter of the National Wild Turkey Federation even committed to an annual donation to, to support these efforts. 
Jim DeVos, who works for the Arizona Game and Fish Department, he's the assistant director for wildlife management. He said, quote, the Arizona Game and Fish Department is committed to conserving and protecting Arizona's diverse wildlife, which is why we are lending our support to the North American non-lead partnership. Our department has placed non-lead ammunition into the hands of our hunters and worked to inform the public to consider switching to non-lead ammunition to better protect our wildlife and human health. Unquote. The North American non-lead partnership works to engage hunters and other wildlife enthusiasts by designing and promoting voluntary measures to increase the use of non-lead ammunition. And then they do a lot with the scientific studies related to lead, the scientific studies of the value of hunting and things like that. Chris Parrish, who's the director of conservation for the Peregrine Fund, said, quote, Voluntary lead reduction programs in Arizona and Utah have been very successful. We want to see these voluntary efforts expanded across North America. We are confident that as this partnership expands, more hunters and organizations will join, unquote. That's this organization, that this, this collaboration of organizations that is expanding. This idea of getting people to use non-lead ammunition, voluntarily replacing their, their lead ammunition with, with copper or other non-lead substitutes. So this is where I have a question for you that could ultimately turn into, specifically if you have older students, that could ultimately turn into uh, like an essay. Why? Why a voluntary ban rather than just simply mandating it? Why doesn't the government come in and just say, we will not use lead ammunition ever again? What I want you to do is throw down some ideas. Why is why why is the emphasis on this? Why do you think the emphasis on this has been towards a voluntary move toward the use of non-lead ammunition as opposed to a mandated move from the government? I'll just throw down some ideas. While you're doing that, I'll explain what I would do with students. Probably when I was teaching middle school, I would bring up something like this. I love teaching controversial topics. And one of the things you could do is you could have kids do this. They could list the pros and cons. They could research both sides. What are the pros of using lead ammunition, the cons of using lead ammunition, the pros of using copper or non-lead ammunition, the cons of using non-lead ammunition. And there's, there's, there's sides of both of those. And then the kids could write a persuasive essay once they decide to take a side. Is do, do you voluntarily or do you mandate it? So now you can get some language arts um, work into here as you start getting some of the persuasive essays. So we have impact on industry. We're already producing lead bullets. It is the dominant ammunition that we have. And so that the impact on industry would be huge. You'd, you'd be putting a significant cost increase, which would also be sent down to the to the users of the of the ammunition. More, more, inter more invested if I volunteer, um, likely to take action and take the better action if they aren't forced to and you have a choice. So this idea of education that we don't force them, people tend to push back against a mandate. They think, that, oh, you're, you're telling me that I have to do this. Well, then I'm not going to, as opposed to if we present it as a positive choice, we educate them about why they should switch and what are the, what are the reasons for this and make let them make that choice on their own. They're more likely to stick to it. They're more likely to, to, to to not push back against it. Um, education is key. They'll often make proper choices when educated as to why there's an issue. Not make it a hardship or a rights infringement, absolutely. And that's basically what we've what we've do done. We're not giving the you must approach, less resistance from activists, so on. If you're giving people the education and you're and you're you're empowering them, and now they can do something where they can be they can have that positive model. They've made the choice to protect the condors. Um, or the eagles, or the vultures, or whatever it might be, rather than mandating it. We are seeing this. So California, I don't know if it's changed, but relatively recent, California actually mandated non-lead bullets in areas where condors were. So if you're hunting in an area where a condor was, because they're not in all, they're not all over California, but in just those specific areas, they required you to do on uh, non-lead bullets. In Arizona and Utah, we have taken the voluntary approach. So what we do is we know all the hunters that get drawn for particular hunt units. So particular parts of the state, we can identify those that have been drawn in units where the condors are found or are likely to be found. And we can, we can reach out to them and we can say, look, here's some information. You're gonna be hunting in this area. We highly encourage you to switch over and use copper bullets. And I believe, and we still might be doing this, we used to offer them a voucher so that they could get one case of copper bullets for free. 
um, if they're hunting in those particular areas. And again, as an option to say, look, we really want you to change your behavior. Some hunters will tell you that they shoot differently, that they, they don't think copper is as accurate as lead or, or whatever it might be. Um, there's, there's reasons why people are kind of can sometimes be stuck in those ways. And we just want to, we just want to give them the best opportunity for success using the non-lead so that they will continue to use it in the future. An update on this, and I apologize for this, apparently it is illegal to carry um, non-lead ammo or to carry lead ammo in California at all. It used to be just in the condor areas, but apparently they banned it. Now that'll be interesting to see because California is such a huge market. We, we see this, for those of you that are teachers and you always see the debate about Texas and the textbooks because so, the Texas is such a huge market for textbooks that they kind of dominate, their standards kind of dominate what goes into textbooks because publishers print towards Texas. Um, same thing can happen in California here. Is there such a huge market? Is that going to shift? Are we going to just see more manufacturers starting to make more copper bullets, et cetera, because California is requiring them to? So we'll see how the market plays out with some of that. Um, we'll also see how it works. Are, are they having success? Are they having increased law enforcement issues as opposed to if we're just making it voluntary? So again, just a thought there, but you saw that the emphasis of this organization is on the voluntary change. We wanted you and your students thus to be thinking about why the voluntary, why not just mandating it? So just an interesting thing you can bring out to your students a little bit. Now we're gonna step back in time and we're gonna talk about vultures throughout history. I want you to imagine a bald eagle with wings that stretch for 21 feet from tip to tip and feathers the size of swords. Give your giant bird a big hooked beak designed to snap the necks of living prey. Give it a body four times heavier than the body of the largest flying bird alive today. The bird you are now thinking of is known to scientists as Argentavis magnificent. It lived in Argentina six million years ago. For decades, ornithologists have fought over whether this monstrous bird was capable of flying. They figured they thought it was just too big that it wouldn't be able to, to fly. However, there was a recent study um, that appeared in the proceedings of, of the National Academy of Sciences that seems to indicate that it would be possible for this bird to fly. And I'm going to show you some of that data on the next page, but I do want to uh, talk about this picture real fast. This is Kenneth Campbell. He's the curator of birds at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. He is standing next to a cutout of this fossilized bird that he found in 1980, this Argentavis magnificence. That's how big that thing would have been. We do believe that there's a relation to the vultures we see today. But here's some information that what this study did was they took a number of birds. They took more than what I'm showing you here. I just took some ones that, that, that are of interest here. The golden eagle, the California condor, Teratornus merriam, which is another large, more or less prehistoric bird, and then Argentavis magnificens. And you can see I, I pulled out some of their data. I didn't want to show you all of it. They had pages and pages of data. Um, that they were able to calculate whether or not it could fly and how it could fly and, and do all this stuff. But I, I just wanted to, to, to show this for scale. So you could see for scale, look at the mass difference of this Argentavis magnificent, 70 kilograms from to the next highest, which was the other historically what we thought were the largest birds ever. These teratorns, we call them teratorns, 13 kilograms. The wing area is meters squared. Wingspan is seven meters, roughly 22, 23 feet across, and they could fly at a speed of about 67 kilometers per hour or 41, 42 miles per hour. This is what we think that this bird would have been capable of doing. Pretty startling. So now I want you to imagine you were one of the earliest Americans. You're crossing over the Siberian land bridge. How would the shadow of one of these huge birds, a teratorn, soaring overhead have felt? Would it have been unnerving? Several Native American cultures passed down stories of thunderbirds, huge creatures responsible for storms and wind. Sometimes they were vengeful and needed to be appeased. In some cultures, the thunderbird often appears at the top of totem poles, and you can see a couple images here. They even appeared on other artifacts, like this painted skin. Perhaps the sight of these birds was so dramatic that legends were born, legends of the thunderbirds. History Channel in a series called Monster Quest, in which they explore the possibility of mythological or extinct animals still living today. In one of these episodes, they looked at the possibility of teratorns still existing in the U.S. 
Some of the evidence is from a rash of apparent sightings that even a and, and even attacks back in the 1970s across numerous states. We're talking like states like Illinois, Idaho. There were these sightings and these attacks. They felt that kids and some adults were being attacked by these large flying creatures. While most of the video is more for entertainment, there is some good science in the video. And you can find it if you go on YouTube and you look up the History Channel Monster Quest. You'll be able to find the episode on Terratorns. I think they call it Birdzilla. One of the more fascinating points is offered by Dr. Greg Bambanek, a psychiatrist. He believes that a fear of large birds is part of our genetic memory, left over from a time when large birds did prey upon our primitive ancestors. So could this idea that this fear of large birds is ingrained in our genetics, could that explain some of the unlovable nature of vultures in our, cult or vultures in our culture? It's an interesting that's got to be a song or something, Vultures in Our Culture. So that's an interesting take on it is could this be ingrained in our DNA? Let's take a look at some other history. That's the history in the U.S. We're going to come back to the U.S. in a little bit. But I do want to talk about another culture that has shaped kind of our viewpoints in the world a little bit, and that's the Egyptian culture. The ancient Egyptian word for mother was mut and was depicted as a vulture hieroglyph. Hora Polo, a 5th century Egyptian priest, wrote that female vultures were so devoted to their offspring that they would tear open their own thighs to let their offspring partake in the blood. Now, vultures don't self-mutilate. We have no evidence that this ever happened. However, many species do regurgitate dead animals to feed to their young. Whatever the case, the Egyptians praised this devotion that the mother vultures had to their young. And so they got symbolized in their culture through the use of hieroglyphs. In fact, Nekbet was an Egyptian goddess who was represented in art pretty regularly as a vulture. Scientists have been able to indicate that it was most likely a griffin vulture that they are representing. You can see that she was she was a god responsible for protecting mothers during childbirth. She also protected the pharaohs. She's often depicted as a vulture in art with her wings around or over those she is protecting. The most well-preserved of these neckbeck artifacts comes from the tomb of King Tut. The vulture appears everywhere in the tomb, from the walls, to the coffins, to the jewelry. Here's on Tut's headdress. He wore five golden am vulture amulets around his neck, a breastplate called the collar of Neckbet, which was a vulture, and there was an intricate vul vulture necklace close to him in his tomb. Clearly, vultures played a an important role in Egyptian culture. And you can see there on his headdress there at the top, there's a snake and there's a vulture. They were representing the two sides in the north and the south coming together under one united king, the vulture being one of those. As you're probably aware, Gettysburg is considered the deadliest battle of the Civil War. There were at least 7,000 soldiers that were killed. But in addition to that, there were about 3,000 horses that were killed in the battle. Now, Given the time frame and the fact that there's this, the war going on, it was very difficult to manage those dead bodies. What do you do with a bunch of people and, uh, and horses that are no longer alive? In some cases, they were buried in mass graves. In some cases, they were just left there. According to Hal Greenlee, who's a retired park resource specialist at the Gettysburg Memorial, Quote, we do know that there were thousands of horses killed here. The experts are sure that the vultures would have been drawn in by the thousands. They could not have resisted that offering. They would have come here from all over the eastern United States. I think there's a good chance that the population increased from the battle, and there's probably direct descendants here from those birds that fed here in 1863. Unquote. In the 1980s, more than 700 black and turkey vultures regularly roosted at Gettysburg in the winter. 1980s. So Gettysburg took place in 1863. Talking over 100 years later, the vultures are still coming to this area that they were drawn to because of all the death that was there. I just think that that's fascinating. There's all sorts of cool pictures that you can find online to show just the amount of devastation that occurred. There's a book that I wasn't able to get. It's out of print. I really tried to get it for this workshop so that I could get, but it talks about the vultures and the impact and some of the sightings people had of vultures, but it's really cool. Now, what's interesting is by the early 2000s, those roosts in Gettysburg had largely been abandoned. So vultures do have this memory towards roosts, but they are also not afraid to move on. 
So in the 80s, it was quite a spectacle to see these vultures there at Gettysburg. Don't necessarily see that anymore. Now let's talk about the Wright brothers. We're going to get to another activity here in a minute because this this one has always been near and dear and close to my heart. I've been fascinated by the story of the Wright brothers and the role that vultures played in it. So let's talk a little bit from this historical perspective. If you're not familiar, Orville and Wilbur Wright, they were known as the Wright brothers. They are the ones that essentially created powered flight. They gave us the first airplane. Okay. Now they did it by looking at birds. And we know that because we can look at their journals. Okay. This is what's this is what's kind of fascinating here is we can look at their journals and see the role that the vultures had. I'm going to show you a couple pages from their journal and we're going to highlight some of what's on there. So here it says the dihedral angle is angle is of advantage only in still airs. It gently increases the disturbing effects of side gusts. And right below that, oops, hang on go back the buzzer which uses the dihedral angle and you can see they even have an image of the dihedral angle in there finds greater difficulty to maintain equilibrium and strong winds than eagles and hawks which hold their wings level and he continues the hen hawk can rise faster than the buzzard and its motion is steadier it displays less less effort in maintaining its balance now just in case you thought it was maybe one page there are pages and pages which talk about the birds and the, the vultures specifically. So here they're talking about hawks are better soars than buzzards, but more often resort to flapping because they, they wish greater speed. All soars, but specifically the buzzards seem to keep their fore and aft balance more by shifting the center of resistance than by shifting the center of lift. Thus, a buzzard soaring in the normal position will be turned upward by a sudden gust. It immediately lowers its wings much below its body. Observations. They sat in fields and watched birds and watched birds and watched birds, and they came up with all kinds of ideas. If a buzzard is be soaring to leeward of the observer at a distance of 1,000 feet and a height of about 100 feet, the cross section of its wings will be mere line when the bird is moving. So and so just keeps going on. This would indicate that its wings are always inclined upward. It keeps going. Let's find it difficult to advance in the face of a wind blowing more than 30 miles per hour. Their soaring speed cannot be far from 30 miles. So lots of pages within their journals specifically reference lizards, vultures, and other types of birds. Now, what I really appreciate about the, the Wright brothers and, and what I think is fascinating when you talk about how they did science is they were very open about their science. They have written openly in letters and journals and all kinds of stuff that they had no intention of making money off of building an airplane. Now, they did build an airplane company that they did, but they weren't going to keep this. Like, they could have gone and patented the airplane and then just been the sole provider of airplanes and made tons of money off of that. But they felt that ability to fly was too important for people to just leave into one place. That should be publicly available. So they, they were constantly collaborating with other scientists who were trying to do the same thing they were. One of those was um, Chanute, and this is a letter that Wilbur Wright wrote to him in May of 1900. Now, this is a guy who was also trying to be the first to build an airplane, and they're sharing their ideas. And, and you can read from the letter, my observations of the flight of birds convinced me that birds use more positive and energetic methods of regaining equilibrium than that of shifting the center of gravity. This next one is key. My observations of the flight of buzzards leads me to believe that they regain their lateral balance when partly overturned by a gust of wind by a torsion of the tips of the wings torsion of the tips of the wings this was the key idea that separated the wright brothers from everyone else who was doing flight who was trying to solve the problem of, of powered flight this idea was drawn up by james Pettigrew in a very very famous book called animal locomotion illustrating this torsion of the wing that the vultures do to keep it steady in flight it was such a big idea that even the smithsonian the national air and space museum on their website indicates that this is the breakthrough concept they call it wing warping and it was the idea that the, the wright brothers instilled this pulley system in the in the aircraft that allowed them to twist the wings that allowed them to remain stable in flight so when they got gusts of winds they could twist the wings they got that directly from the observations of the birds here's a newspaper article from 1906 the title of it is secret of aerial flight 
rested from the birds, and you can read the little pullout sections that I did in there. We studied the birds of the air, particularly buzzards and the larger birds, and compiled tables relating to the atmosphere and to wind resistance as applied to airplanes. Before we attempted the construction of our first flying machine, we knew that we must apply the principle used by birds in flight before it could be any sort of success. They go on, all that we can tell you about the principle of the machine which we have invented, said Wilbur, the elder of the two brothers, is that it is on the wing or, or aeroplane principle. We have no doubt that we have solved the problem of aerial flight. We've discovered how a bird is enabled to sustain itself in the air and to fly in any direction and at whatever height it desires. This principle we have applied to the flying machine. Brothers, the credit for the idea that changed the world and got us flying to their observations of buzzards. In mind, I have another little activity for you, and I've done this one for a while in, in various workshops, so some of you might have seen this stuff before. But what I'm going to do here is um, we're going to cut this idea of biomimicry. And if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to, to research it. There's a, there's a lot of cool organizations out there. There's a lot of cool lesson plans on biomimicry. But this idea of engineering um, to solve problems based on how life has already solved the problem. So looking at how animals and plants have solved particular problems and using that to see if we can replicate that to solve other problems. You could do cool lessons on this, like how do you keep a desert home cool with no air conditioning, and you can study how animals dig burrows and what they do. There's all kinds of things. But we're going to do one based on birds. We're going to look at the wing design of different aircraft and compare them to the wings of different birds, and I want you to match them up based on their purpose because not all aircraft have the same purpose as you're going to see here in a minute. So what I'm going to show you is there's four aircraft that we're going to talk about. First one is a helicopter. And to give you a little bit of description, they're rotors, but they're basically two wings that move independently, which give helicopter the ability to hover. Then we also have the P-51 Mustang, which has short round wings that provide maneuvering during dogfights. So this is a dogfighting aircraft. It needs to be very maneuverable to chase down other aircraft. And we have the... Um, the B-29 bomber, which is, has long, broad wings that provide more efficient soaring for those long bombing runs, so they don't have to use as much fuel to go greater distances. And our last one is the Concorde, which has angular, triangular wings, lo which lower the resistance, which increases their speed. Okay, so those are the four aircraft we're going to be talking about. Here's our four birds. I provided you a picture of the bird as well as a silhouette of what they look like in flight. If you don't know what the birds are, there's a Cooper's Hawk. There's a peregrine falcon, there's a hummingbird, and there's our friend, the turkey vulture. This, this wouldn't be an activity if we weren't talking about vultures here. So what I want you to do is match the, the airplane, we'll start, the aircraft. We'll start with the helicopter. What bird do you think was used to model helicopter? I'll give a few examples there. I'll, I'll let you guys put in some answers. Most people seem to be saying the hummingbird. So let's check our answer here. And you are correct, right? The hummingbird has two wings. The wings actually um, work independently, much like the rotors of a helicopter that allow it to hover in place. Okay, so what's the next one now? Let's look at the P-51, a dogfighting aircraft, a highly maneuverable aircraft. How would that, which bird would they have modeled after for the, for the P-51 Mustang? Now you got to understand your bird biology a little bit because now it gets a little bit trickier someone says the first bird says the peregrine cooper's hawk we have a couple for the cooper's hawk couple for the peregrine let's see which one we have this one is actually the cooper's hawk um, the Cooper's Hawk is a highly maneuverable bird, and, and I don't expect you to know all of this. When I do this with kids, I give them some information a little bit more. For this setting, it was a little bit ch um, challenging. I wanted to make it a little bit harder for you guys. Cooper's Hawk is a maneuverable bird. It actually hunts other birds in the air, and often it does that through forest stuff. So it has to be able to maneuver around trees while it's chasing other birds down. So you can see in the profile there, the wings are a little bit shorter. And they're a little bit rounder, much like the P-51. Gives it the ability to, to change direction a little bit more. They also use their tail a little bit in some of their... So now let's look at the third one. Which one most replicates the, the bomber? The long-soaring bomber. A couple guesses for the vulture. Seems like that's where most people are going. And of course, you are correct. The vulture is a soaring bird. It's not known for its speed. It is known as a soaring bird. Um, catching thermals, conserving energy in the best way that it can so that it it, it can 
um, store for long distances to find food. Good job. And of course, that leaves our last one is the Concord matches with the Peregrine Falcon. If you're not familiar, the Peregrine Falcon is um, one of, if not the, there's some speculation that there might actually be some faster ones, but might the, the for a long time, was considered the fastest animal on Earth. Um, can fly at speeds of well over 100 miles an hour um, during its, what, what's called its stoop. So you can already see its wings in there are, are already triangular shaped, which is common to falcons. Um, but when it, when it tucks its wings into its body, it looks like a big flying missile. It goes way high up in the sky, enters it stoop so it tucks those wings in and then it darts straight down towards the earth until it takes out another bird and in that move the, the peregrine falcon is not a remarkably huge bird but it can like take out ducks and other large birds like that that are flying it does it in midair and just pummels straight into the bird um as fast as it can um but they have it has that triangular shape when it's flying to take on um increased speed to lower the, the the air resistance which is then what we modeled the the, the concord after the sr-71 blackbird the space shuttle all of these fast flying um ships aircraft have that sort of triangular shape so cool another fun activity you can bring into your kids when you're talking about biomimicry now we know that vultures then uh, have been important culturally to various cultures around the world and we also know that they've been important um, historically, when we look at Gettysburg, we look at the Wright brothers. They are also important to our human health. I extracted this information from a, from a scientific paper. It was a very, very technical paper that got into some complex math and statistics that was beyond my pay grade, my understanding. I was able to get out some of the information. Numbers don't look remarkable. But I will tell you that there's research supporting this, okay? So this is looking just at India just at vultures in India and other issues in India. In 1992, there were 10 million vultures in India alone. And in 2003, by 2003, they were down to less than 80,000, less than 75,000. There were about 72,000 vultures in India. Okay? In that same time frame, I saw a per capita increase in rabies cases. 17 rabies cases per million people up to 18.6 cases per 1,000 per, per 1 million people. Now there is a lot more than a million people in India that we're talking about a billion people. So that number gets significantly higher when you when you start start looking at that. Now this is an interesting thing because this this gets if you teach this idea of correlation versus coincidence. And is this really a correlation or are these just two stats that just happen to, to, to fall under the same time frame, but they aren't related? It's an interesting idea. I will tell you that the studies have been done and the scientists have determined that there is a correlation between the declining population in vultures and the increasing cases of rabies. What I want you to do is explain, tell me why. Why would less vultures mean more rabies? that for a minute and then I'll show you a little bit I'll share with you a little bit more data. Why do less vultures result more rabies? Good guesses coming in. So as I'm as I'm reading the answers that are coming in, we're getting a couple different aspects of of this. You're all getting to this idea that they're controlling the disease transmission and somehow the vultures are impacting the disease transmission. But there is an element that's missing that some of you have picked up on, and it's the dog. Dogs play a role in this. Something of like 96% of rabies in India is transmitted through dog bites. So what we found, what the scientists found is through doing this research, and this is the University of Bath in the United Kingdom and India's Institute for Economic Growth, seems to indicate that as the vulture population lowers, the number of feral dogs increases. So the feral dogs start to take the role, they, they take over the niche that the vultures had, right? So nature abhors a vacuum, right? So when you remove something from it, another thing is gonna fill in. The vultures get removed from the system, the dogs take over. So now you have vultures that were taking care of all the dead organisms, they're not doing that. These dead organisms are piling up. Now you've got an increase in the dog population as they start to be the ones that start taking out the carrion and the dead animals. They become the scavengers. And then more dogs means more bites and more bites mean more rabies. Interesting little piece there that we've been able to, to decipher from here about the role that vultures play in our, in our human health.
Okay. The sudden loss of India's vultures has made a significant impact to the lives of people in India. Without these scavengers to dispose of the dead livestock, feral dogs descend on the carcasses. But that's not all. In America, we know, we have, re we have evidence that turkey vultures remove and neutralize dangerous pathogens such as anthrax and botulism. So their stomach acids are so strong and so unique that they can actually take care of some of those diseases. Um, they also clean up the carcasses before they can pollute the water, air, and soil. If we were, now we don't right now, we, turkey vultures are on the increase, but if we were to have something similar happen in the United States or anywhere in the world, if we see a decline in vultures, the world could face major public health problems as the, the because of what is removed from that. The vultures take care of some of these diseases on levels that we don't we don't really truly understand. And when you remove them from the system, you have you increase that exposure. So public health is a significant issue when we're talking about vultures and the role that they they can play. This was this was interesting. I threw this in at the last minute. This was a Facebook post. Now there is a zoo in Utah. I'd have to look, I, I don't have it on here, but they have a condor called Andy N. Condor. That's his name. And he happens to be an Andy N. Condor. So you can see their little play on the name that they did. I guess he's such a character at the zoo and the, and the visitors like him so much that they created a Facebook page for Andy. And they put they post some fun little things on there. They they post a bunch of vulture facts. I encourage you. You can see the thing there. If you have Facebook, go ahead and like the page. It's fun. They throw out vulture information. But on the day that this workshop was originally scheduled, this was the post that came out, and I thought this was fascinating. Um, and I'm going to read part of it just because it, it may be slow. It, you might not be able to to read it. it. Might be too small. Just me being cute to get your attention, and now I have it. I want to tell you, I want to ask you for a favor. Tell one person today about how vultures around the world are keeping ecosystems healthy by preventing the spread of diseases such as botulism, cholera, rabies, polio, tuberculosis, and anthrax. If all of my friends tell one new person, that will be 14,000 more people who know how special and critical vultures are. And hopefully 14,000 more people who want to help make sure my wild cousins stay healthy so they can keep on keeping everyone else healthy too. I just thought it was funny that the same day that we were going to be talking about vultures and the impact that they have on, on human health, they posted posted this up there. Um, and that's really essentially what we're doing. The role that we have found at Game and Fish is to tell you guys so that you go on and tell your 100 students or 30 students or 150 students, however many students you work with, and sharing this idea about vultures and the role that they play. So they are very, very important towards human health. But if you want, again, a fun little page to follow on Facebook, Andy and Condor is one of them. I wanted to take all this information that we've been doing about vultures, and there, there's far more that I could have covered. Um, I, I had to narrow it down in, in, into the time frame that we had. But we want to talk about how we can share this passion now, how we can share this love, how we can dispel the negative feelings about vultures. And one way that I found is powerful to do that because it also addresses the need that we have in Arizona, particularly um, in language arts, which is writing and, and writing different and, and understanding reading and um, things like that. So I have a couple poems that I wanted to share with you that I think is a, is a, is a cool way to kind of share this love of vultures. This is a guy, if you're not familiar with Douglas Florian, I know many of you elementary teachers probably are. I love Douglas Florian. He has a, he has a number of books, but he does all the artwork in his books, and then he creates poems about animals. And each of his books is a different theme. So there's one called Encyclopedia, which is all about insects. The, this one is called On the Wing. And you can tell he's just got a very quick, fun little poem about the vulture. Two things I know about the vulture. Its beak is strong. It's weak on culture. And you can see the little a vulture playing violin there. Um, that's just one example of it. Um, I do, just to give you an idea of the style of Douglas Florian, how each of his poems is a little bit different. Um, I had another poem from him. This one's not about vultures, but it is about another organism that's in our Unlovable series, and that's bats. This is one of my favorite ones from him. The bat is batty as can be. It sleeps all day in cave or tree. And when the sun sets in the sky, it rises from its rest to fly. All night this mobile ant mammal mugs a myriad of flying bugs. And after its night out on the town, the batty bat sleeps upside down. Again, Douglas Florian, great way to introduce poetry. You can have your kids write poems based on the information that they've learned about vultures at a very elementary level. If you want something a little bit more, this is gonna get a little bit 
dark here, but there is a famous poem by a guy named um, Robert, Robinson Jeffers. You can see a picture of him right there. He wrote a poem called Vulture. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to give you the gist of it is this idea. Basically, he was at the end of his life and he's walking around and he catches sight of a vulture and he's pretty sure that that vulture is just waiting for him to die. And so the poem basically ends with, dear bird, we are wasting time here. These old bones will still work. They are not for you. But how beautiful he looked gliding down on those great sails. How beautiful he looked veering away in the sea light. Over the precipice, I tell you solemnly that I was sorry to have disappointed him. To be eaten by that beak and become part of him. To share those wings and those eyes. What a sublime end of one's body. What an ensciment. What a life after death. Now, it's kind of morbid. It's kind of dark. But this idea that he felt, th th this changing idea that we have, that we fear vultures, but he's writing a poem about how cool it might be that that would be the end of your life, that you die and then you become one with the vulture and you become essentially into the air, into the sky with the vulture. You rise up from him a little bit. Kind of a cool little idea. It's a complicated poem. Kids could kids could learn about that. But this idea is not far fetched. We have numerous cultures out there, including some in India, that believe that that would that that's part of their death ritual. Is they will take the body, they'll take them to the top of a mountain and let the vultures eat them, and they feel that that's how they pass on to the afterlife. That culture is actually having some significant problems because of the decline of vultures. They are having to find new ways to deal with their dead bodies that still meet meet their culture because they don't have enough vultures to deal with it. So interesting little challenges as well and judy, uh, judy is mentioning that buddhists do that as well now robinson is not alone in this some of you might recognize this guy edward abbey a very very famous conservationist he famously wrote in desert solitaire one of his more famous books um he, he has a passage in there about what happens if you get lost in the desert and you can read it there comfort yourself with the reflection that within within a few hours the human flesh will be working its way through the gizzard of a buzzard your essence transfigured into the fierce greedy eyes and unimaginable consciousness of a turkey vulture whereupon you too will soar on motionless wings high over the ruck and rack of human suffering for most of us a promotion in grade for some the realization of an ideal he probably read from Robinson Jeffers a little bit and had the same idea of how great it might be to be eaten by a vulture and become one with the vulture. Changing that idea of that vultures are really kind of a cool critter. A little bit dark, but also kind of a, a, an interesting thing that you could have some of your older students analyze. With that, I have one more activity that I'm going to introduce to you. I call it the six word memoir. It goes by a couple of different names. I've used this in a variety of different activity contexts. We're just gonna do this very, very quickly here. What I want you to do is you're gonna write a biography of a vulture. You're gonna tell me about a vulture figure out what is important that you would want to, people to know about the vulture. But here's the catch, and you can probably get this from the title of this activity. You can only use six words. If you had to tell somebody about a vulture, what would be the six words that you would use to describe a vulture? tell people why they're cool, to tell people why we should care. Six words. That's what I'm asking you to do. Do that quickly here, but see if you can take everything you know about vultures, everything you love about vultures, and reduce it into six words. We'll see how well you do with this. And I'm going to share a couple of your guys's as they come through. West wrote, wrote, rejoice, I pick up after you. So that was a great use of six words. I find this activity, as, as you guys are writing, I'll, I'm going to give my experience with this activity. I've done this at a number of my workshops, particularly my literacy ones. I really enjoy this one because it, it, it requires kids to, to really think and to get at the nuts and bolts of what they're writing. In this case, less is more. How can they use six words, choose every word carefully to get at the gist of what they're saying? I mean, we have Sean who's taken a slight. So, so Wes did his as one sentence, which is perfectly fine. And I've seen the other format, which is what, what Sean did. Did he basically took six words that described them vital, cleansing, majestic, grand, needing help. Both of these are, are two different ways to tackle the problem. And I've seen them both done um, just as effectively. Those are great, great versions death, birth, vision, and transformation. That might only be five words, Judy, but that's okay. We'll give, we'll give you credit for it today. 
Jennifer is saying you could you could do a form of acrostic so you could have the word vulture running down the page and then they could think of something that starts with each of those letters. So what would be vulture? What would be V? What would be U? What would be L? So they could do that as well. Any of these different strategies to get them thinking about what they've learned and how they can share it. They can create a poster. They can do something like what David, uh, what Florian did by creating an artwork that goes with the poem. A couple more that we'll, we'll share here. Anna came up with cleanup, soaring, visionary, necessary, environmentally helpful. If you still have some, that's great. I'm going to move on. I want to go back to that quote that we started with. That very sort of negative view of how vultures were looked at at the end of the 19th century. And looking at where you are with the, with the six words that you've provided, clearly we've moved. We've shifted from 1878, thinking that they were disgusting creatures that vomited down chimneys and, and attacked pigs, to visionary necessary environmentally helpful birds that pick up after you transform that need help that are majestic and grand and cleansing and vital those are the words you're describing they've come a long way in the 150 years since since this first was published i want to switch over to this quote i think this quote in my mind is a better description of vultures and this comes from a book which i highly recommend it's called vulture the private life of an unloved bird i borrowed heavily from this book to get some of the material because there's not a lot on vultures so when you find a really good one like this particular one i ended up using a lot of information and then she provided resources at the end that i could delve into more like getting into that scientific study about India and rabies. I was delving into that, but I really liked her description of a vulture. I think this is better than that 1879 version. A turkey vulture is a perfect creature. It is neither prey nor predator. It exists outside the typical food chain beyond the kill or be killed law of nature. Although without death, it would starve. On six foot wings, it floats above our daily lives, waiting for the inevitable moment that will come to each of us, to every living thing. Then the vulture transforms these transformations, these deaths, into life. It wastes nothing. It does not kill. It is not a murderer, and it is not often murdered. The tur turkey vulture waits, waits and wanders on its great wing sails. I just thought that that was really kind of a cool description of the vulture and a much more positive way to end than the way that we started with that quote from the Curiosities book. So with that, I want to ask you if there are any questions. And while you go through typing any questions that you might have, I'm going to flip here to the, to the next page just to give you some credit. You know, pictures were provided by Arizona Game and Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. There's the book from Katie Fallon. Again, I borrowed extensively from it. Um, she had some great information. It's a really good read. It's kind of cool to take a look at. There are some vulture resources. I've put together a themed page focused on vultures. Go to our, our Game and Fish education page, azgfd.gov slash Focus Wild, and you click on the themes tip tab, you'll find a whole bunch of pages centered around themes. So there's one on bats from the previous workshop. There's there's one on vultures. I'll be able to find all sorts of lessons, including the one on the, the biomimicry that we've done. If you want to do more workshops, I encourage you to stay in touch. We have a Facebook page, and then you can go to our website. And you can also sign up for the education newsletter, which is an email that I send out a couple times a year. It doesn't come weekly, but it's just when I get a new workshop out or a couple new workshops, I'll say, hey, registration is open for these workshops. Head over here and sign up for them now. There's my contact information if you need it. Thank you. I, I'm very humbled that you will find this of value enough to participate in. So thanks. For